forward. Okay, did everybody hear that? Recording in progress. Got it. All right, hi everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Good day. I hope you have a good two hour time slot with this uh, wonderful launch with all these great and amazing people from all around. So we have people from across the United States, we have people from the Middle East, we have people from Europe, from the UK, from Ireland. So we are, you know, we are the world basically in little, um, little icons today. <laughs> so um, I want to welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for your interest in Indelible. And above all, I want to thank all the wonderful contributors. It's such a great honor uh, to have your works featured in our, in our journal today, today and for the rest of the next six months before we, uh, we move on to the number six. So um, this is about artichokes, apricots, avocados. I mean, I was so hungry. This was not an easy process editing this issue it was it was amazing it's like editing a menu it's like um i don't know it was it was torturous in a way but it was wonderful so thank you for all the stories and recipes and, and amazing artwork that you've contributed and uh you know it makes us I, I really feel this connection with everyone through food it's like one big table so i see it as a huge dining table uh with this issue especially and um, without further ado, uh, we will move to our contributors who will be giving us a five minute teaser about their work. Uh, if you would like to show us your artwork, then feel free to share your screen. Um, if you would like to read an excerpt from your short stories or, um, or any other um, articles that you've written, then you can do so, of course. And if you just wanna tell us about your work, then that's also amazing. So um, we will start with, well, I'll just go with whoever is first on the list because I put the bios according to, okay, Maria, Maria Donovan. Oh. Hello. Maria Donovan, first of all, was, um, she's an amazing writer. And uh, we also had the honor of hosting her during the Indelible Festival of Literature last March. So for those of you who do not know who Maria Donovan is, Maria Donovan is an award-winning writer based in the UK. Her debut novel, The Chicken Soup Murder, was a finalist for the Dundee International Book Prize and is published by Saran Books. Find out more about Maria at www.mariadonovan.com. Maria, the floor is yours. You can tell us a bit about your wonderful novel. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, The Chicken Soup Murder uh, does have a murder mystery in it, but it's also very much to do with um, love, grieving, and meaning of family. So if it's all right with you, I was just going to read my little bit at the beginning, because sure, that will be about five minutes. Is that okay? Of course. Um, the narrate, I have a slight difficulty is that the narrator is a 10-year-old boy, so... Hmm, you'll have to imagine. So it's a 10-year-old boy called Michael. Okay. The day before the murder, George Bull tried to poison me with a cheese sandwich. Time, he got me in a headlock in the playground, patted my face like he was being friendly, smiled for the cameras and said, Why don't you and me have a picnic? George Bull. He's George to the teachers, Georgie to his dad, but to me, he is just bully. He let me nod and breathe and walk me off to a corner of the field. Up on the hillside, the girls are playing houses, marking out rooms on the ground with lines of cut grass left by the big mower. Janie and I used to do that when she wasn't playing football, but she had left me behind and gone to big school. I felt Bully's arm around my neck and remembered that I mustn't call it big school. He let me go and got a tea towel out of his bag to use as a tiny tablecloth, like we were going to have a nice time. It had a scene of Dartmoor on it, 
and I knew it was the one our neighbour Emma used to pin to the wall. She was my nan's best friend until Bully's dad moved in with her. I hadn't been in the kitchen for a while. I looked at the ponies and pixies and remembered what my nan said, that there ought to be a chain gang and a view of the prison. Right then, nanny's boy, said Bully. He took my lunchbox and sniffed my sausage sarnies. Mmm, here, pushing a packet of sandwiches in my face. You have some proper food for a change. What is it? Cheese. Well, he knows I can't eat cheese. It makes me ill. OK, I'm not allergic. I won't stop breathing. I will maybe get a bad headache and throw up. He won't kill me. Only last time he was punching me, Bill Bully kept saying it was wrong to be intolerant. So I'm not using that word again. Get it, et, he said and dug his dirty fingernails into my nan's homemade bread. Nan had slicked up the sandwich with mayonnaise and ketchup the way I like it. He chewed with his gob open, so I could see the mess, pink and brown, going round in his food mixer mouth. He ripped open a packet of crisps. I love crisps. But I knew he wouldn't give me any. Eating them, he made as much noise as a giant crunching bones. My tummy rumbled. What sort of cheese is it? I said, opening one of the sandwiches and peering inside. Because I can eat sheep's cheese or goat's cheese in moderation. In moderation, he said, exploding wet crumbs. You are asking for it, Harry Potter. I've only got the haircut. Thanks, Nan. Not the glasses or the magical powers. Sometimes, though, I shut my eyes and wish. I wish Bully would just disappear. I dream of him and his dad leaving. I want to believe that good things are possible. Someday I will find out that life is only pretending to be shit. Here is your wonderful surprise. Even saying the word shit in my mind, mind makes me feel uneasy. Nan wouldn't like it. I don't want to do the test tomorrow, said Bully. Are you ready? No. We've been doing sats all week. Science next. Stuff like interdependence and adaptation. Even though I like science, I'm scared I'll get it all wrong. How can you feel sick and hungry at the same time? I wish I was a producer, like a tree, so I could feed on sunshine, air and water. But I am a consumer. I have to eat. I wished I could eat grass. What do you always find at the start of a food chain or web? A green plant. A cow eats grass and out comes milk. But leopards and lions don't try to suck on a cow or a goat. They just eat them up. That is an irreversible change. I said, said Bully, what did you get for that third question in maths? Now there's bad things coming in threes. First, Jenny's dad died. Then Irma's dog. And then Irma got a boyfriend. But even though that's bad, it's not like someone dying. It was going to be a long, hungry afternoon. Unless maybe... If I wished hard enough, this time the cheese wouldn't do me any harm. I took a nibble and felt the inside of my mouth sting. That's it. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful teaser of your novel. <laughs> so um, I believe they could, uh, if, if anyone is interested in purchasing it, um, it's available from Seren. From the website of Seren, yeah. Anyway, the link is there on, on uh, Indelible, so um, feel free to browse with the work of Maria. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this with us again, Maria. I mean, it's a different take on food. It's, mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. So next, we will move to Josh, Josh Pachter. Hello, Josh. Hello, you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, Hi. yeah, now we can see you. 
Okay, so Josh is a regular contributor to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, a translator of fiction from Dutch to English, and the editor of anthologies, including The Beat of Black Wings, crime fiction inspired by the songs of Joni Mitchell, Amsterdam Noir, and The Man Who Read Mysteries, the short fiction of William Britton. In 2020, he received the Short Mystery Fiction Society's Golden Derringer Award for Lifetime Achievement. He teaches communication studies at Northern Virginia Community College and in the early 1990s taught English at the American College in London. Josh, we would like to welcome you again. And um, also, you know, from the, uh, the darker side of food. <laughs> Thanks, Rula. Uh, I thought about reading an excerpt from the story that's in the, the new issue of Indelible, but then I thought, well, everybody who's here knows how to read. So rather than reading an excerpt, uh, I thought that what I would do is tell you the story behind the story. Uh, much more often than not, my short fiction uh, begins with a title. I'll uh, see or hear a phrase in a newspaper or on television, and I'll think, now that's a title for a story. And then all I have to do is come up with a plot and a setting and some characters and, and, and there's a story already written. For uh, Christmas of 2014, my in-laws gave me uh, this book. It's a, a fascinating little volume called Lost in Translation, an illustrated compendium of untranslatable words from around the world. It was written by Ella Francis Sanders and published by 10 Speed Press. Uh, as I leaf through it, I, I chuckled to find uh, gezellig, which is my favorite untranslatable Dutch word. And then I came to a dead stop four pages later at Pizan Zapra, which is listed as a melee noun, meaning the time needed to eat a banana. Now that's a title for a short story, I thought. And it seemed obvious that the story it was a title for would have to be set in Malaysia and would unfold over a period of no more than a couple of minutes, the amount of time needed to eat a banana. Well, I've never been anywhere even near Malaysia. So I did some basic research and discovered that there is some disagreement as to whether or not Pizan Zapra is legitimate Malay. Some sources say yes, it is. Other sources, including some native speakers of Malay, say they've never heard the phrase. But still, it was in the book, and I thought I'm using it as a story title. Uh, and as I continued poking around the internet doing research about Malaysia, I stumbled across some fascinating information about a vengeful vampiric spirit known as the Pontianak. In Malay folklore, the Pontianak are said to be the ghosts of women who died in pregnancy. They're generally depicted as pale-skinned beauties with long hair dressed all in white. A Pontianak usually announces its presence through the cries of a baby. If the cry is soft, that means that the spirit is close. Although it lives in the trunk of the Pokok Bizong, the banana tree, its presence is sometimes accompanied by the fragrance of the plumeria flower, followed afterward by a terrible stench. The Pontianak uh, identify their prey, I learned, by sniffing out clothes left outdoors to dry. Uh, for this reason, some Malays refuse to leave any article of clothing outside their residences overnight. A Pontianak kills its victims by digging into their stomachs with its sharp fingernails and devouring their organs. If you have your eyes open when a Pontianak is near, it will suck them out of your head. And when the Pontianak goes after a man, sorry, gentlemen, it may rip out the poor guy's sex organs with its hands. So, Pizan Zapra and the Pontianak. Who could ask for anything more? This turned out to be one of those stories that pretty much writes itself, or, 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 or maybe it was a vengeful melee spirit that guided my fingers across the keyboard. In any case, I wrote this story and I submitted it to Linda Landrigan at Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, 
Uh, and I was delighted when she selected it for publication in 2016, the magazine's 60th anniversary year. Five years later, I heard about Rula and Indelible. And when I saw that she had put out a call for material having something to do with food, I dug out my banana story, Pizan Zapra, and sent it to her. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to know that more people will now have a chance to read and hopefully to enjoy the story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you. I see Dr. Gottfried Hoyer. Um, he was laughing at you know some of the details, which were very funny, obviously. But I believe Dr. Gottfried Hoyer would also be thinking analytically, you know, from a psychological perspective about all these symbols. <laughs> So, um, Dr. Gottfried, would you like to go next? Uh, no, sorry, it's it's my turn. It's my turn tomorrow. I'm terribly sorry. For the art, would you like to share your artwork? Uh, uh, no, uh, I'm 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 doing a poem next. Uh, oh, okay, all right, okay. Well, anyway, um, just so everybody else knows, uh, Dr. Gottfried Hoyer has shared some wonderful digital art as well on Indelible. So, again, don't forget to take a look at that. So thank you, thank you, Gottfried. And uh, yeah, Dr. Gottfried is one of the world's best um, Jungian analysts and psychologists. So he might have a lot to say about so many of the things that are written in Indelible. <laughs> okay, so um, next we move to Carol. Carol, hello, I don't see you anymore. Yes. Yeah, now I see you. Good okay, morning again. So good morning, yeah. Carol. Um, today you'll be sharing your art with us. Actually, I didn't know that I would be sharing my art. So I'm reading tomorrow as God okay. forgives. And I'll just say quickly that thank you again for including my artwork and my poetry. And um, I'll just say that I love both the written word and images. And, uh, you know, there are a few of my paintings and drawings in the issue. And um, yeah, thanks again for including them. Well, thank you so much for sharing them with us. Again, um, you may all want to have a look at Carol's beautiful artwork. Thank you. Um, and we're, we're all waiting to hear your poetry and Gottfried's poetry tomorrow as well. Great, looking so, forward. Yeah. Uh, Lorette. So we will do some art with Lorette. Uh, Lorette is sharing photography with us this time. Um, Lorette is the brilliant artist behind Indelible's previous issues. So she is a wonderful, wonderful artist. Uh, Lorette is a Toronto-based writer who studied journalism but loves poetry and small fictions. Her work has been published widely and internationally and nominated several times each for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. She recently won first place in a flash fiction contest at McQueen's Quinterly. Her work has been translated into Urdu. Her most recent book, uh, Pretty Time Machine, and there's a new one right now, uh, which is uh, Winter in June. Is that, is that right, Lorette? Yes. That's Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, Lorette is also editor of the Ekphrastic Review, a journal devoted to writing inspired by art. She is also an incredible award-winning visual artist whose collage paintings have been collected in over 25 countries. You can visit her artwork at www.mixedupmedia.ca and you could also visit the Ekphrastic Review, which is a wonderful, wonderful journal dedicated to writing about art, about visual art. So Lorette, the floor is yours. You may wanna uh, talk to us a bit about the food in Mexico. Thank you so much, Rula Maria. That's uh, such a lovely introduction. Um, great to see everyone today. So Mexico for me is the most inspiring place I've ever been to. I loved to travel before we were um, locked in here. And I've been to a few places around the world, but I go to Mexico as often as I can. And it's quite close to us. I'm in Toronto, Canada. So it's about five hour plane ride directly there. And it's usually quite economical to get to on a whim. Um, so that's just proved great for me because I'm so inspired by everything there, the art, the color, 
the music and the food. So I will share a few of the photos that I took there. I took so many. Um, I sent Rula some that were themed food and I wrote up a little bit about those as well. So um, hopefully I can read that quickly or just a portion of it, but I'll try sharing the screen and hope you can all see. Okay, can everyone see these photos now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll just scroll through those and then I'll, I'll read a bit of my story or um, explanation. This is from the Day of the Dead celebration that I've been to in a few different parts of Mexico. Uh, this uh, lady here with her fruits is in Merida, which is on the coast of the Yucatan. This lady is making tortillas and cakes. A big truck of pineapples in Puerto Vallarta on the west coast. So those are a few of the photos. I am hungry for Mexico. It is the most exciting place I have ever been. A world of color and creativity and chaos where I feel remarkably at home. Mexico City is dazzling. It is overwhelming and exhausting, the intensity of it, but life without it feels empty. Mexico gives me inspiration to write and paint. Its history is one of tremendous imagination. From the murals to the dance to the history of Mexican photography, there is such an incredible range of creative expression and being immersed in it gives me new wings for my own work. Nowhere does the spirit of Mexico show itself as dramatically as in its food. Mexican cuisine is beloved all over the world for its spice, array of flavors, ingredient range and artistry. I have many cookbooks and I'm fortunate to have access to authentic Mexican ingredients at home in Toronto but eating there is something different altogether. The markets must be experienced in person. Sky high piles of vegetables, limes everywhere, women pounding avocados, hundreds of assorted chilies and buckets of cactus paddles. Cafes and restaurants are always colorful with every surface painted pink, orange, turquoise and yellow. At taco trucks, you can gorge on exquisite mouthfuls of sweet and spicy meats covered in onion, cilantro leaves, and the hot and cool wonders of salsa verde. For a snack, follow the cheese puff peddlers through the streets. They carry massive bags of cheesies and you can get them sprinkled in hot sauce. The pizzas are the best I've ever had, thin crust Italian style, available everywhere. The moles from the southern region of Oaxaca are legendary. Velvety, chocolatey tomato sauce for chicken and other dishes is a complex labyrinth for the taste buds. And everywhere also are tacos, arabis, shawarma, Mexican style, a special fusion of kebab and Lebanese flavors with local ones. There was an influx of immigration from Lebanon starting in the late 19th century. It pays to carry a small phrase book with you if you are adverse to nose to tail foods. A few times I have held up my hand and said, Cinco tacos, por favor, only to learn later from friends that I had eaten taco de cabeza, tenderized goat brains. Tacos de ojo are also popular, cow eyes, slippery and gelatinous rounds with pico de gallo. Tripe and tongue are common fry ups as are numerous other organ meats. These traditional foods have great nutrition to offer but may take some getting used to. Most people ask about the bugs, of course. It's common to find edible insects on offer. There are hundreds of kinds of creepy crawlies used in Mexican cuisine. I have not been as brave with these as I hoped. The guisano de magüe worms were not bad, better ground into salt. The chapelines are everyone's favorite, prized snacks the nation over. I couldn't handle the texture of these grasshoppers or the smaller crickets, but worst of all were the stink bugs. While they are served cooked and mixed with other ingredients, true aficionados eat Jumilis live. 
They have a distinct fetid flavor this way, and it's an acquired taste, but they're believed to be medicinal with magical aphrodisiac properties imparted if you can stomach them. In the depressing lockdown of the pandemic, I nourish my imagination from time to time by making my own salsa from tinned tomatillos, brewing Mexican cocoa with chili peppers, or making huevos divorciados, divorced eggs. They are eggs with both red and green salsa separately on the plate. I have even tried making chili rellenos, my favorite stuffed peppers. I'm hungry for the bustle, the sounds, the colors, and imagery of the food in Mexico, but I suppose it will do for now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. That was marvelous. That was a, a really nice five minute trip to Mexico uh, with all the five senses included, especially the taste. So thank you so much. You. Um, that's wonderful. And um, I was telling Lorette, like when she sent me the photos the next day, um, I told her that we had Mexican food for dinner because I mean, how can you after reading what she said and after seeing the photos? So yeah, that's a bit of too much temptation. So thank you once again, Lorette. And I see that we have uh, Marilyn or Marilyn Sawaf with us today. Hi, Marilyn. Is it Marilyn or Marilyn? Oh, wait, let me see. Marilyn. Uh, so Marilyn shared some wonderful, wonderful paintings with us for this issue. Uh, really gorgeous paintings. Uh, I want to thank you again, Marilyn. This was a great oh, honor for us to feature your work. Uh, would you like to share the paintings uh, on the screen? Well, um, I'm surrounded by paintings and I don't know how I would share them, but you can view okay. them on my website. And I also made that little movie on YouTube that I think yes. you shared. Yes. Where we can see why I'm painting the immigrants because I was an immigrant myself. I live in the United States right now in New Hampshire. And um, so thank you for asking me to join. And I really enjoyed knowing about your public publication. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. It's a great honor. It's a great thank honor. You. Thank you very um, much. For those who do not know Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Sawaf was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and lived in Europe, in Italy, and the Middle East, Lebanon, and Egypt. After her arrival in the US in 1980, her first paintings were inspired by her education in interior design and architecture and her taste for enig enigmatic, colorful images. Since 1981, Marilyn had been involved with many galleries, countless art exhibits in the New England area, and a constant research into the creative side of painting. In 2006 and 2008, she received awards from the Courier Museum of Art in New Hampshire for her figurative paintings. In 2011, she became a member of the Copley Society of Boston, one of the oldest and most prestigious art associations and galleries of the Boston area. Influenced by medieval, Russian, Oriental, Indian, and Persian art, she noticed that she could visualize her secret world with different applications of paint. More about Marilyn's paintings can be seen on her website, marilynsawaf.com, and there are also some YouTube videos that have been shared on Indelible. So, so it's a great pleasure. Those. Great <laughs> pleasure so to much. meet you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you nice for being, you too, and all thank of you. Thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next, another artist, Erica Pascual. Erica is joining us from Hawaii today. Um, Erica is a Filipina American artist and illustrator based in Hawaii. She created modern enchantment studios to share her passion for the arts, nature, food, culture, and crafts, sometimes in a way that reflects her peculiar sense of humor. Her love for drawing and telling stories led her to the California College of Arts in San Francisco, where she is currently working on a comics MFA. To see more of her work, you can follow her Instagram page, Modern Enchantment, and her Twitter page, also at Modern Enchantment. So Erica, we would love to welcome you. Um, incredible painting, incredible artwork. Um, they're so funny um, and lovely to look at. So if you would like to share them, you can. If not, if you just want to talk about them, then that's also OK. OK, hi. Thanks for having me. 
Um, let me see if I can share the screen. I was searching for the page real quick. Um, oh, where did it go? Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is the page. Um, so these top two were just, I, I created them as character studies. And it's ba they're basically characters that kind of represent um, different versions of anger in myself. So there's one that's more of like based off of childish anger. And then there's one based off that's, that's a little bit more sarcastic and they kind of take on these little um, alter egos, I guess. Um, and they all have different tastes. Um, this one is an excerpt from another comic that I did. This is a journalism comic. And what I did was I interviewed my family um, about their childhood in the Philippines. And um, this was basically about Christmas time. Um, so this one, for this page, I asked them about if, about certain dishes or special dishes that they would have. And one was this sweet macaroni salad. Um, and this is what, and this is basically made with condensed milk and whatnot. So questionable, but I've tried it before. It's not bad. <laughs> um, this is something that we would often have uh, when I was, I guess when I would visit as a kid and I would have birthdays there. So this is basically a hot dog on a stick, but then they would put marshmallows on it at the very top. And this is an illustration of Park Sinigang. And it's basically, Park Sinigang is basically, it's a soup um, that's made, or it has a specific taste. And it's basically from the tamarind. Um, so this is like a comfort food for me. And then this is actually a dish from a restaurant here in Honolulu, and it's a place called Manichi Ramen. But this is a pork and wasabi uh, dish. Uh, this is these are pins that I made, and I would I was selling at my on my shop for a little while. Uh, this is shrinky dinks, and this is basically empanada, which is a street food in the Philippines, and sili, which is which is a chili vinegar that you would use as a condiment for this um, snack. And so that's basically all I had for the site. Uh, right now, if you wanna see more, I am doing, I'm working on a, a Squarespace account right now. So this is where you could see more of my illustrations and full comics if you wanted to check them out and the links to my website um, or my little Etsy shop. Oh, you do stickers too. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah that's it. but you know, when I first saw the pork belly um, picture, I thought it was a photo. I mean, it looked so oh. real at first glance. Really? So, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing and um, welcome on board Indelible. We hope to see more of your work also in the future. Thank you Thank so much. And next we move to another artist, um, the exceptional Gallery. Gallery, hi. <laughs> so Gallery has contributed with um, an essay, um, an autobiographical essay and uh, some painting. So Gallery, would you like to talk about both or is it just one of them that you would want to talk about today? Yeah, I think I'll just talk about the, the essay. Okay, so uh, um, to introduce Gallery, Gallery, uh, is it Khoye or is it Khoy? Uh, if you feel like saying kh, it definitely is kh, but uh, in America it's Khoye. Khoye, okay, <laughs> so we say Khoye then. Yep, yep, if, you, if, if you're so inclined. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Gallery Koei um, is an artist, writer, scholar, and DJ. Her artwork has been widely exhibited in group and solo exhibitions and has received numerous awards. She has curated multimedia art exhibitions, conceived and implemented creative arts and live music events, and she operated an art and music venue called 39 Hotel in Honolulu. She holds a BFA in painting and art history from the San Francisco Art Institute and two MAs in depth psychology from Pacifica. 
And her website is galeriecoy.com. Uh, and her artwork featured in this article, um, the article that she has here is, um, actually no, it's the artwork taken from an article called The Big Book of Rain, right? right yeah. Uh, an old book of morality tales that she filled with collages, paintings, drawings, and writing. So that's for the artwork. Uh, but Gallery will be speaking to us about the essay that she wrote. Thank you so much, Rula. I really appreciate it. It was a very kind introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for having me and listening. Um, I kind of explored, you know, when Rula asked me to contribute something for the food issue, my, my immediate reaction was um, a little bit of fear because uh, my relationship to food has always been a little bit problematic. Um, and uh, uh, so my mind immediately went to the sort of the, the pathological side of eating. <laughs> and um, so that's kind of what I wrote about uh, I, I just sat down and wrote three pages and um, I was worried that it was a little too strong maybe, uh, but, but Rula said she liked it and wanted to publish it. So it, it, it went in there. Um, for, for me, um, eating has always been problematic. I either would eat too much or I, I, or I wouldn't eat enough. And um, so this sort of sense of nourishing myself um, nourishment that is involved with staying alive, you know, so when you, when you can't really nourish yourself, um, you kind of are in a, in a relationship with death and on a psychological level. So I'll just read the opening paragraph that I think um, aptly explains the situation. And I'll kind of maybe just leave it there. <laughs> if you're interested, you can read the rest. It seems to be a unique peculiarity of psychological ailments, but the fullness of an event only reveals itself once it is no longer a major issue. Once it has used off the excess neurotic fuel supply so that it burns smoothly and with purpose, becoming finally an efficient fire, a steady source of libido and self-knowledge. I'm speaking here of my lifelong dis-ease around food a perpetual fountainhead for neurotic and harmful behavior whose recollection makes me cringe with fear and alarm. This kind of ailment is usually referred to as an eating disorder, something that should be normal, should be ordered, like food at a restaurant, but is not. Since eating food and surviving as a living organism go hand in hand, it is not surprising perhaps that the word dis is another name for the Greek god of the underworld Hades, the Roman Pluto. To have an eating disorder is thus to be psychologically involved with death, just as having a disease is to be circling around the idea or possibility of death. Discord, disharmony, disjointed. All these words beginning with the prefix point to the presence of the underworld and its terrific gravity, which pulls downward, demanding to be heard, felt, sensed, respected. <laughs> So I'll just kind of leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much for sharing this experience, Gallery. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I'm sure many people can relate to it, including myself. I mean, um, I only discovered a few years ago that I was hypothyroid and um, I have Hashimoto's. And I've always had this, I mean, at, at, this, at some point in my life, it was a very problematic relationship with food as well. I mean, food for me was something I needed to have, but I was afraid if I, I mean, I, I didn't know how much was too much because I constantly found myself expanding um, until I discovered what the problem was and, uh, you know, things started changing from then. Uh, but thank you so much. I mean, uh, for many of us who can relate to this, we know how complicated this issue can be and how much of a toll it can take on our lives. Uh, but I think we all love food now, right? And that's why we're, we've contributed to this wonderful issue. So we're seeing the artistic side of things now. Thank you so much again, Gallery. And um, next we will move to a chef that we have with us today, a chef, food blogger, and founder of The Writing Room, which is a creative outlet for aspiring young writers. Mark Comerford, hello. I'd like to Hi. welcome you. Yeah. 
Hi everyone, a uh, pleasure to be here with you today. I would like to start by thanking uh, Indelible and Rula for putting all this together. It's great so far. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark and I'm a chef here in Ireland. Uh, I've worked in some prestigious kitchens around the world in, in Canada, in New Zealand, Japan, and most recently here in, the, uh, in Ireland in the world's number one hotel. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I decided to take all my experience and um, put that to use in, kind of in what I hope to be a more helpful and um, sustainable manner. Uh, I started writing about my experiences and the serious side of food, particularly subjects such as the one I've uh, published today. So the global population is projected to rise to 11 billion people by 2050, and yet at 7 billion people, we're already failing to feed our population. So my article examines the disgraceful food waste we see in all countries around the world uh, and what solutions we can implement to bring about real tangible change. Thank you very much. I think I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Um, your article is wonderful. It sheds light on so many important issues related to the great food waste that we Thank are you. living in. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have uh, Pierre. Hello, Pierre. Hello, Ura. Hello, hi, I can see you now. So Pierre is joining us from Lille in France today. Uh, Pierre is a French philosopher, game designer, and uh, entrepreneur. After a PhD in analytical philosophy, logics, and game semantics, he escaped from his university. And by the way, Pierre is an escape game artist. Uh, now he creates the games which provide the experimental materials he couldn't find in the amphitheaters. One day he will return from his adventures in the world with new insights. So Pierre, uh, the floor is yours. I know you have a lot of amazing things to talk about. Yes, hello, Rula. Uh, so uh, I write a little article which is called Free Mysterious Dish uh, served with recipe telling as a narrative form. So uh, recipe telling as a narrative form uh, is, a, is a kind of experiment of writing. The, during the lockdown, uh, I, I wanted to make new kind of enigma. And uh, you know, we can't uh, run escape game during this time. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of people who make uh, we who make them food delivery deliver to them. So the the first idea was to try to deliver mystery recipe, mystery food to people. But um, I wasn't able to make it, it uh, alone. It's, uh, uh, it, it it would. Uh, uh, it was too hard to develop in uh, so so few time, but I had this problem: how to write enigma about food, and uh, and so I begin to question and to question myself and to explore my own story, why I wanted to to make that except the, the problem and. Uh, I uh, so, so so I I think about uh, I I make some uh, some cooking too. So what uh, what I do and the the maximum problem is problem was that I can't just uh, give a recipe without making a narration about this recipe. So. I wonder why, and I write this text. I will try to just uh, read it because I will uh, say too much if I fix something else. So often I, I feel too verbose and too wordy when I give my recipe. Uh, naturally, people listen with the curious politeness 
of those who speak out valuable information from a gigantic mass of speech. But I cannot ignore the despair in their eyes. Nobody expects such endless dissertation on the perfect timing in pasta cooking. And yes, there is a lot to say about the perfect timing in pasta cooking. But I return to the text. Where has gone the concise style of this little recipe cut out from the magazine? I think it's the family syndrome. I never seen my grandmother uh, read this uh, recipe. She collects the recipe, she never read it. But as far as I can remember, the transmission of recipe has always been in my family a kind of spoken cabal between initiate. I can see my grandmother very ritually uh, Mimi, uh, Mimi uh, can you give me your receipt? Mm. She closed her eyes, she looked inside and she tried to find something, but it's not a book. It is gesture, odor, color, something which is not in the book and she, she in her memory trying to reconstruct some uh, event in which she made this, this receipt and, uh, and so on. So the receipt is always linked with a specific event. Uh, and so it is a narrative form. But uh, we can return to the subject. Uh, if it is a narrative form, what is recipe telling about? About a recipe, yes. But what is the tale? What is uh, why the tale is important? Uh, it can give a mythological dimension to the recipe. It can revealing the very origin of the dish and its genealogy. But we've got a lot of other configuration we can explore. Uh, and the purpose of, the, of, of this article was to explore some kind of this configuration. Uh, uh, when I write this article, uh, I uh, discovered that uh, in the technical language of French uh, for the cooking, we have at least uh, 55 words to say cutting things. Uh, really, I, I, we have them. And uh, there is very fantastic words. And I want to use it to kind to create something new. You know? for, example, for example, mirepoix. Mirepoix. I, I even don't know how to say it in English. Diced. Not teeny diced, big dice. <laughs> and uh, it's very strange. So, uh, uh, what does it mean for people to be mirepoixed, to be changed into mirepoix? Oh, and so we want to 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 write story about that. So, I make three three example. Uh, I, I have the time for one or not? Um, well, you have the time to read an excerpt from one, yeah, like yes. two minutes, so yeah. Okay, the, the alchemy of the green lion creme, which is a kind of uh, imitation of Gaspard de la Nuit, to be uh, honest. So, three days of sleepless night, three days of perusing the cryptic tomb from de la Mirandole, but the arcane stood quiet. In my mortar, under my pestle, I mixed the queen's milk and the, freak, and the fruit who speaks for you, but never the green lion's roar. The cream turned to a sluggish mud. Is this fermentation a part of the great work? I couldn't believe it, and kept perusing the cryptic tomb from De La Morandol for three days of sleepless night. On the fourth night, and uh, we suspend the, the narration and this uh, kind of uh, uh, 
um, cliffhanger. Yes. No. On the fourth night, so I fell asleep in, and in my dream, I saw the angel of Citrinas under the sign of Venus. She said, the lion you are looking for rose only in the secret of a tomb. Protect it from the breath of life under a layer of primitive jelly. At the dawn of the fifth dawn, I was able to perform the miracle. Following the angelic guidance, I then lemon joys to the mixture, but it in little vessels and emetically close them with jelly. And it is the proof that even in cooking, the easy half of the path is study and erudition, but the hardest path, the hardest half path is the experience and the revelation. Tata, and then it's a beautiful conclusion, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Pierre. Um, your recipe narratives were amazing. I mean, especially there was the one about the, the bean croissant. Uh, uh, that was really nice. So um, hopefully um, now all of you who are here will, you know, you got a small sample of uh, what's on Pierre's menu. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you. It's a, it's a very original form of writing, by the way. Um, it's, it's marvelous. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thanks. And uh, next, we move to Paula, Paula Messina. Paula is a writer and public speaker who lives outside Boston, Massachusetts, close to the United States' first public beach. Her short story, The Other Lawrence Ham, will appear in the September 2021 issue of Thema, or Thema Literary Journal. She's a reader for LibriVox.com and is currently writing a novel set in Boston during World War II. So Paula, welcome aboard, and we are all ears. Thank you. It's nice to see all these faces. <laughs> Tomatoes. Proust had his Madeleines. I have my grandfather Nanu's tomatoes, large red orbs with pink flesh and a taste unmatched by any other tomato. I haven't eaten a decent one since he died. That's a long time to go without a good tomato. I'm still searching. I was nine when Nanu died at the beginning of the growing season in New England. There were no tomatoes that year, no Nanu tomatoes. He died before he made it to Hull, the peninsula that juts into Boston Harbor and never saw his precious garden again. And I never ate another tomato plucked from one of his vines, still warm from the sun. I believed I had only the vaguest memories of Nano himself. Then I saw the Godfather, the family scenes, the closeness, the joy of sharing good food and music were familiar. When Marlon Brando collapsed in his tomato garden, tears flowed. To this day, thinking of that death scene makes my eyes water. My memories still aren't sharp. I no longer hear Nanu's voice, though I know he spoke to my father in Sicilian, a language that predates Italian. I remember Nanu in his green upholstered chair, watching his grandchildren play. My oldest sister tells of visits to Boston's North End, where Nanu was treated with respect wherever they went. I, rem I remember reading his name on the sign outside the funeral parlor, Don Gaspare Messina. Like my grandfather and his green chair, the funeral parlor and the elderly Italian men who treated him with, defer who treated him with deference are long gone. It was in his garden that my grandfather was most alive. You can remove a man from Sicily, 
but you cannot take away his love of the earth. I see him digging the soil, watering his plants, caring for them the way one caresses a cherished treasure. Nanu grew much more than tomatoes. He planted beans, squash, peppers, and apple, fig, mulberry, and peach trees, grapes for wine, and a riot of mint running the length of his grape arbor. The last time I was in Hull, I was horrified to see that my cousin had cut down or uprooted each and every one of my grandfather's trees and plants. So much for my cousin not falling far from the tree. The only possible explanation for his indifference to our grandfather's legacy is that he was a toddler when Nanu died. Why were Nanu's tomatoes so much better than everyone else's? Skill must have been involved and maybe the salt air and hull soil were factors. For me, this is one of life's imponderables. I don't need an answer. I don't even want one. My grandfather's tomatoes were the best, will always be the best. I guess we don't get to choose our memories, just as we don't get to choose our family or where we're born or the color of our eyes. Tomatoes are a rather odd object to cling to metaphorically. They squish if squeezed too hard. They turn mush if neglected. But tomatoes say a lot about a man. Nanu poured love into his garden and he shared that love with his family. It might seem like an odd way to say, I love you, but it worked. I guess that's why tomatoes don't taste the same. They aren't worth eating if they aren't infused with the grandfather's love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, you know, your, your piece was, it really brought tears to my eyes when I first read it. I mean, it's just amazing. And um, I, I can also relate to this, um, this relationship between what our grandparents grow and how they tasted when they were still there. So, um, and you're right, yes. Um, my grandfather's tomatoes were, were also special. Um, his lemons, his olives, everything. So thank you so much for bringing out this special connection um, in your very special piece as well. Thank you, Paula. And uh, I would like to thank everybody again for joining us today and for sharing their marvelous work with us. Uh, I will also hand the mic to Ahmad right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we've got some, que we've got some questions and some uh, inter inter interchange and dialogue. So first of all, Hedy, uh, you know, says one of her photos to Lorette. She loved the references to Lebanese food. She mentions how there are numerous immigrants to Latin America from the Ottoman, during the Ottoman Empire from Lebanon into um, Latin America. So yes, I, I've actually been something about that recently as well. It's a fascinating um, melting pot to use a kind of a telling idiom. Um, Josh says he understands that 25% of the grain harvest, this is Josh to, I think it's to Mark, 25% um, of the grain harvested internationally is eaten by rats and other vermin due to ineffective storage. Does that sound right to you, Mark? And if and if so, what can or what should be done about it? That's the question for Mark. Um, so, Mark, do, would you like to answer, or should I just go for? I mean, how, how if you would do you have a reply to that? I mean, given that that there's so much waste, is there anything we can do about it? Yeah, I, I did send a reply in the chat. Um, oh, let me find it. Sorry, it wasn't straight no, away. No, no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you say, Josh. Um, the number looks seems accurate, um, but the problems are at every level of the food chain. So, um, you know, every stage of the process from harvest, storage and transport. Uh, and so obviously it, it's not just the actual final product that, that creates the problem. It's, it's a problem, it seems, Mark is telling us that happens 
all the way across the, 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 the chain. I would also say, I mean, it's also political, I think. I mean, why do people invest in property continuously when, when there's not enough people for the houses? It's the same thing, I think. I think there's a capitalist motive, I think, or, or incentive to keep the money circulating when there's no need for it, or at least when there's waste is, being, is providing, keeping profits up. That's just my two pence anyway there. I could be wrong, it's not my field, but I just have, a, I remember reading something about that. And then we've got, sorry, um, Yes, Hedy um, was very appreciative to um, Pierre, and I, I also like, I, I love Pierre's uh, talk. I was going to say one interesting thing, an association, just as you're talking about cutting and food, obviously cutting is the primary verb for editing narratives and, and forging and, and soldering a text. So it's a kind of cut, 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 like like French butter is essential to all editing, you know. Um, that was just something that occurred to me. Um, so Mark replies to, um, uh, I think it's Gelare. Is that how you, sorry, is that how you pronounce it? Um, um, so he appreciated the the, 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 the the tenor of your talk. Obesity is a growing problem across the world. And it's primarily, Mark is saying, attributed to the nature of processed food as opposed to access to organic, presumably, or fresh, fresh ingredients. Um, uh, Omar, uh, that was uh, Mark. Mark's response was in response to my comment. Um, I read this amazing book called uh, A Brief History of Tomorrow. Have you all right. heard of Noah Yuval Harari? He said that by 2050, the majority of people on the planet will be over overweight. And so that's what Mark was uh, re responding to. Right. Sorry about that. That's my, uh, okay. I'm just, you know, because it's built up. So and there's a lot of appreciative, appreciative um, comments to uh, Paula's beautiful text. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, also empathize with it. They have similar experiences of, the, the interface of food and family and love and care and investment, emotional investment, it seems to be. Um, and uh, I think apart from that, that's that's it. I'll, I mean, a lot of appreciation, but not many questions as yet. Um, I was gonna say one thing to Pierre. I mean, I noticed the, the narrative thing with, 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 with food is that there's a similar idea in the sense that when you get a, when you make an inference, you get like a, a, re a reflective winning in your life. You you think about something in a new way. Part of what makes that insight, you know, a, an insight is the story of how you got to it, moving from A to B. I mean, that was a recent uh, idea in a book I read by Charles Taylor about the, the nature of the story of how you come to your conclusions being in part the validity of your conclusions. And I think you were saying something similar, Pierre, about how you know, um, the process is actually part of the, fi the finished product, or maybe I, I could be wrong. I mean, that was just something that occurred to me. Um, but I'm quite, I think what I was thinking was that maybe you should think about playing with the idea of cuts, uh, editing and, and food, you know, maybe that would, could be the, the, the trigger for a new narrative for you. I don't know, maybe, I mean, it just occurred to me. Um, apart from that, I think that's everyone uh, appreciating everyone as you as you would because this has been a, a, a wonderful selection of people and uh, um yeah that's that ruler that's that's all the questions and comments right these are the questions and comments in the chat box but would anyone like to take the mic and say something so feel yes. free to do so it's a, it's an open mic yes no maybe Okay. I just like to say thank you for arranging this. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much for being on board, Paula. Um, we look forward to more wonderful work like this. And you know, your your piece was was also very special because my grandparents lived in in Revere, so it's like you know I'm hearing a voice from Revere, reading about a grandfather's tomatoes. It's, uh, it's great. And um, especially at this time of the year, we would get ready to visit for the 4th of July, uh, where we would spend at the beach at night. So it's a very special place for me. And I haven't been there in so many years. So thank you so much for um, striking this family chord here for so many of us, not just for me, I'm sure. Paula, I'm going to be reading your text um, on, online now once we finish. So I want to look it up and read it because 
I also have a small piece called Chocolate Gifts, which is about my my father and the the, the right or ritual he has of giving chocolate to my daughter. So it's kind of it's a much oh. smaller, it's a shorter piece than yours. But I want to read yours to, because it it triggers something in me about you know my current experience, my current family experience. So I'd like to, I'm going to read it in full once we're uh, once we're consummated here. <laughs> Thank you. And speaking of chocolate, I think one of the most worrying things for everybody uh, for 2050 is that chocolate will be extinct by That's 2050. Horrible. What? What are you talking about? Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, it on, it's only growing and being cultivated properly in the Ivory Coast at the moment, and Mars are heavily investing in trying to stop this in the tracks, but it's not working. Hence, Mars' uh, recent acquisition of Wrigley's and some uh, big pet food companies are trying to get out of the chocolate game because in 30 years time there isn't going to be any more chocolate. Why, why is that Mark? Is it for economic reasons or? Uh, it was massively over farmed. Um, there was no economic benefit to a lot of the farmers in uh, in Africa and <clears throat> like I said it's being it's practically if not literally only grown in the ivory coast now at the moment so wow that's, that's, if mars that's... can't stop it with all the billions they're investing i think everybody needs to hoard a little milk chocolate <laughs> i'll start tomorrow <laughs> as 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 sweet as it is it's not really good for us it actually is it's the sugar and milk that we add yeah. to it of course of course yeah Yes. Uh, there's a uh, jammed full of flavonoids and other phytochemicals. Dark chocolate mm. and red wine is actually a, a superfood combination. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, hearing this, I've already entered the first stage of grief, denial. I refuse <laughs> to believe this. It just cannot happen. Yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um yeah. so Ruben, um, yes. I was just going to say there are another a number of writers in the audience who, who are just audience members. I don't know if you care about um, that. Yes, of course. Um, you mean um, any new writers that we haven't met before? Well, they're just writers I know who showed up. We just lost one, Claire Murray. Oh, is okay. Writer, as is okay. Stephen Rogers. Jim Williams. And there's Grace, Grace Thompson as well. Hi, Grace. I, Laurie Schnebley is a writer. I don't know if she may have had to leave. Oh no, she's still oh, here. Oh, there but she she's is, yeah. Here. Hi, Laurie. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I left, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. I think that was it. Amy, do you consider yourself a writer? You're still muted. No, just... Oops. Sorry, just a fan, not a writer. Okay. <laughs> you know, but that's close Paula, enough to being a writer. So. <clears throat> Paula, when you asked uh, if Amy considers herself to be a writer, I sometimes uh, get asked to speak to uh, elementary school and middle school groups uh, about writing. And the first question I ask them is, how many of you would like to be a writer someday? And, and most of the hands will go up. And my reaction to that is, well, stop wanting to be a writer and start recognizing that you already are a writer. Mm -hmm. If you know how to walk, you're a pedestrian. And if you know how to move a pen or a pencil across a piece of paper, you're a writer. The question is, do you want to be a better writer? Do you want to be a professional writer? Do you want to get paid for your writing? But I think it would probably be safe to say that absolutely everybody in this group today is a writer. Thank you. Hello, Amy, you're a writer. Uh, when my daughter was around six years old, she would make her own books and um, she'd come visit me in the office after school and she would be busy writing and illustrating her own books using my staplers, uh, you know, making it look like a book. And when anyone would ask her if, you know, what she was doing, she'd say, I'm publishing my book. So for her, you know, making it, getting it done, having it in front of her, she's her own publisher. And um, she used to get really ticked off whenever I asked her if she wanted to be a writer when she grows up, because she would tell me I already am a writer. I've published books. There you go. So, yeah, um, I would tune in with Josh and say, then, yes, I think we're all writers. And if I could just follow up on something that Paula just added to the chat, she pointed out that Amy is 
the widow of Paul Marx. Uh, and two things quickly about that. First of all, not necessarily everybody in, in the room today knows Paul Marx work, but you should. Paul was just one of the great, great writers of crime fiction. And I encourage you to look him up and read his work. That's number one. And number two, Amy, I'm, I'm, uh, I've said this to you via other manners, but uh, it's, it's an opportunity now to say face to face that I am so sorry for your and for your families and for our community's loss. Paul was truly a treasure. Paul was a great writer and he was a greater person. Mm. He was a wonderful person. Absolutely. And he was beloved. He was beloved by so many. It was a tremendous loss. Amen. Thank May you. I jump in? Okay. Sorry. So sorry about your loss, Amy. Thank you. Uh, somebody was saying something. Sorry, I. No, I wanted to, can you uh, uh, can you see me or hear me here? Yeah, Maybe yes. not. You got me or not? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm Jim Williams, and uh, I met pa uh, Paula online, uh, swapping emails. And uh, I'm a writer out in uh, the Santa Barbara area of California. And uh, one thing about writing that I've found in the years that I've been doing it, and I started in 1984. Um, it's an outlet. I live alone now. I'm a, a widower, have been for several years, and uh, it provides the outlet, uh, the expression that I want. Uh, I've written now about seven books, and I'm happy with that. Uh, I've got a couple more in the works at the moment, but I spend hours and hours doing it, and during the pandemic, everybody else told me how lonesome they were, and I wasn't because I was in a room with all these imaginary characters circling around me. And uh, I write basically fiction, although I do uh, nonfiction as well. But uh, it's been a pleasure to watch. And I want to say to Paula, I really, really enjoyed your uh, uh, piece about your grandfather and tomatoes. And it's so great to meet in person here. Zoom is a wonderful thing. Yeah, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And you can tell that big, it's Big Jim has- Correct had a career in radio. You have a great radio voice. It's getting a little older than it used to be, unfortunately. <laughs> it's still a great radio voice. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, thank you, Jim, for being here today. Thank you so much. And, um, oh, uh, Dixie, I see you now. Hi, Dixie. <laughs> Hi, Dixie has also shared some wonderful work with us, Hi. some great artwork. Um, so uh, well, it, this has been wonderful. Thank you for having me and for having my work and your beautiful, beautiful, indelible. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Dixie, and for sharing your incredible work. Um, Dixie's work on food is different than uh, food in the conventional sense. Like it's not about fruits and vegetables. It's more of food for the soul. Um, a little bit it's, of abstract. It's more about nurturing your soul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. If you would like to join us in the poetry uh, section, we will have Dr. Gottfried Hoyer and Dr. Carol Mora reading poems as well. Dr. Omar Sabbav will also be reading his poetry. Dr. Hedi Habra. And am I missing anyone else who's reading poetry tomorrow? Yeah, me, I might read a poem as well. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this was wonderful. Have a wonderful uh, whatever next meal you're having next, <laughs> lunch, dinner, and until we meet again, hopefully tomorrow. So, and please share your work on social media, uh, spread the word, spread the beautiful, beautiful artwork and writing that you have all contributed with. All right, see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank Pleasure. you all, bye. Yeah.